want to thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be able to open your word and to walk through these scriptures, in particular as we're looking at the Gospel of John. We ask you to touch our minds, open the eyes of our understanding, help us to see what you're showing us, help us to hear what you're saying to us, and ultimately, ultimately help us to make that life application of your word to our lives, that we become doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. I thank for every one of my sisters that are uh, that are here on this Bible study as we take this journey together. We thank you so much for Pamela and for the time she's given to us to just lead us, take us as we, as we just walk with you through the scriptures, as you take us from one point to the other, just being in your presence, in your word, the Holy Spirit, we give everything over to you and we ask you, that you will guide, you will direct, you will unveil what seems hidden from us, what seems to be a mystery and you want us to know, make it clear. As we go back in time, as we go back into the land of the Bible in the time of John, your servant, help us to grasp what we need to grasp and to make that application for this day that we're living in, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, Pamela, over to you. Well, hello to everyone, uh, my dear sisters of the English garden. <laughs> I have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. I just I feel, feel like I'm in a family reunion, actually. Wonderful. And it's so wonderful to, to be able to sit like we just have to imagine ourselves that we're sitting around a table, all of us at one table uh, to study the word of God. And uh, how wonderful it is that sisters in the Lord, we can get together and do this because it's so important. It's so important for our spirits and our bodies too. It, it, studying the word actually uh, increases our health. The more word you get into your spirit, the more health you get. It, it's amazing. It's amazing how the Lord works. So uh, we are going to study the gospel of John and of course, uh, coming from Israel and coming from me, uh, in particular, you're going to get a really different perspective. And um, hopefully, God willing, I will be leading you in a proper way. But it's going to be quite unorthodox um, in terms of uh, the standard underst understanding of John because uh, we were discussing it earlier, when you read the Bible in a country that is outside of the land of the Bible, there are a lot of things that drop away that you miss. And one of them is the language. And I'm actually going to introduce quite a bit of language into our study. And um, another thing is just understanding the topography, the geography of um, the gospel and the climate and the seasons and the calendar and the times of day um, and the feasts, all the celebrations. And there's quite a bit in chapter one. It's amazing. It seems like a simple um, kind of cosmic philosophical chapter, but no, it is really filled with all kinds of references to really down the earth things. And um, so we're going to really have, I, I wasn't even able to get to the end of the chapter, there's so much material. Uh, and we're, we're talking about Jewish material. Now, when I say Jewish, I, I want to abandon that adjective and I want to replace it with Hebrew material. Mm -hmm. um, Hebrew and Israeli, Israelite, 
because we're going to we're going to understand what how it was in John's time how the land was divided up into districts um, because for the last five thousand years the land is always being divided up into districts and the districts have different names so we're going to uh, address first century how things are uh, laid out and organized in terms of the geographical districts. And then I'm going to uh, focus on uh, the two languages, although I'll comment a little bit about the Greek, but Greek is not central to this chapter, not at all. Um, and I've made this discovery uh, just from my own experience uh, in the last five years, we've been going to Jordan and we've been working with uh, Iraqi Christians and their uh, mother tongue is Aramaic. And I've made this amazing discovery and I actually am in school now studying classical Syriac, which is their, their Bible language. And it's one of the ancient languages that was being used to translate the New Testament uh, in the east, east of the Euphrates, and also um, in eastern Syria, northeastern Syria, southeastern Turkey today, and then northern Iraq. So uh, that is an element that I am going to introduce uh, today because it's really important to understand um, John from a different perspective. I know that when you hear, um, very often it's becoming really popular nowadays that preaching is uh, a lot of people will refer to Greek words, which is fine, which is great. And I've even done it in your church. <laughs> I've <laughs> mentioned Greek words. But actually, uh, the Aramaic is much more important. Uh, it is indeed the second language of the Jewish people. Hebrew is the first and Aramaic is the second, and I'll explain that to you. Okay, so I want to begin not even in John, but in um, the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24. And um, Pastor, I would love for you to read. Um, this is going to be Luke 24 in verse uh, uh, 40, 44. This is a very important verse that we begin with. Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now, when we, when we uh, understand that verse, we know that Jesus is talking about their Bible, the Bible that they had in the first century, uh, the Bible that they had at, at that time. And uh, the Bible, we refer to that Bible today as the Old Testament, but that's not really a good term for it. The, a, ter a better term is the Hebrew scriptures. And we know that that was the Bible, period. They didn't have a New Testament. They had, that was the Bible. And it was compiled from the time uh, it was compiled and canonized basically from the time that they returned from Babylonian exile. That exile lasted 70 years and it began in 586 BC with the destruction of the first temple. And this was the tribe of Judah. This was Jerusalem and Judah. And they were taken off to Babylon. Uh, we know the prophet Daniel, of course, he was there. Ezekiel was there. And then when they returned, we have the accounts of Ezra and Nehemiah of the return to rebuild the temple um, because of the decree that Cyrus, the Persian king, made um, 
concerning uh, the rebuilding of all structures that had been destroyed by um, Babylonian invasions. And so the Persians allowed each country that they ruled over, they allowed each country to have their own religion, their own temple, and uh, their own kind of economy, but under their rulership, which were the satraps. Uh, book of Esther is another book mm -hmm. written in the, that time. Okay, so um, it's really important to remember the Babylonian exile, because what happens in that exile when they're in the 70 years in Babylon is that the elders of the exilees, the Judeans who were exiled from Jerusalem, was that they understood that they had sinned against God and they needed to repent and return. And in order to repent and return, they needed to consult God's word. And in order to, to have God's word to read it, is they had to bring together every scroll they could find and copy the Bible and then study it and determine what were the books that should be in this library. Let's call it a library for now. And from that time uh, they formed a large assembly and uh, which eventually became known as the Sanhedrin. You've all heard that term Sanhedrin, right? Okay. So from the time they returned, which is 515 BC is the time when they rededicated the second temple, which was being built. Uh, they rededicated that. And in that period of time of the rededication, the decisions were being made concerning the books that were supposed to be assembled into this very important library, which would become their scriptures. So that includes, of course, the first books to be assembled would be the first five books of Moses, followed by the history books. Um, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, and uh, Joshua and Judges, and the prophets, all the prophets. And then later on, all the writings, which included the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job, um, the prophet Daniel is in this group, um, Esther, uh, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and first and second Chronicles. Um, Esther, I mentioned, Ruth is in this grouping, and that those are called the writings. Now, Jesus in um, Luke refers to um, the last portion of the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, as the Psalms, and that's, um, that's a very apt way to describe it, the Psalms being the largest book of the writings, but they're known as the writings. So it's the uh, first five books of Moses, which is the Torah, followed by the uh, prophets, followed by the writings. So that is the how the, the Bible is um, compiled, and that is what they were using. Now, the next thing we need to understand, and um, this is going to apply to us as we study John, is that the Bible was not all divided up into chapters like we have today in our Bibles. You know, chapter one, chapter two. The Bible was divided into what we call parashot, which means a portion. And today is uh, Shabbat, or it's over with now, but um, uh, today was Shabbat in Israel. And every Shabbat, we read a parasha, a portion of scripture. Uh, we read from the law of Moses. We're, we're in the book of Exodus now. And then we follow that reading with something called Haftorah, which is actually a reading from the prophets, which kind of echoes the portion that we're reading in, in the Torah. So um, the word parash 
and that would be um, a PRSH. You could write that down if you want to remember it. Parash means to separate or to divide. And uh, that's really important to understand because the Lord is constantly doing that. Um, he begins in creation by separating um, the light from the darkness. He separates the waters so that there's a sky and then there's water. Um, and he constantly is going through and either uh, separating physically or he starts to separate according to his judgments, uh, which is very interesting. So that word, um, P-R-S-H, uh, parash, that is the root for um, the separating or dividing. And uh, that is the first word I want to share with you because um, scripture is divided according to little portions. Um, and a bigger portion, of course, is called a parasha, a parasha. So um, John is actually divided into like stories. It's, uh, it's really not chapter one or chapter two. And so in actuality, we're not going to finish <laughs> chapter one today but we will uh, get through uh, what's known as the, uh, it's very well known as the prologue and then the passages um, on John the Baptist. And that's interesting because we're actually in the right time to do this. Uh, today is January 16th and January 18th is really the last day of the Christmas season according to the ancient churches. The Armenian church is the last church to have their last Christmas holiday. Now there, there are um, actually three holidays in the Christmas cycle of the ancient churches. Uh, the first one, of course, is the birth of Jesus, followed by uh, the visitation of the Magi. And that is followed by actually the most important event, which is the baptism in, of Jesus and the revelation that he is the son of God. That's called epiphany. You all, you all mm. know that. Okay, so I think I'm, if I'm not mistaken, January 18th is the epiphany of the Armenians. So we've gone through here in the land, we've, we've, gone, we've gone through two epiphanies and we're about to have a third epiphany. Um, and it happens down at the Jordan River, usually without the pandemic, everybody goes down to the Jordan River to be baptized. And of course, that is to remember what takes place here in John's gospel in chapter one. Okay, so I uh, addressed about the parasha. And um, now the... Um, in, in Jesus' time, they did not have the scriptures sewn into a, a book-like form, which is called a codex. They had scrolls. And so it's interesting. They, they um, uh, those many of you have been with me and we've been um, in Qumran where they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. That, Actually, they just discovered huge libraries and the scrolls were kept in jars in, in that site. And uh, another way to keep scrolls were to um, lay them on shelves uh, rolled up if they were using them uh, frequently in that manner. But they were uh, best stored in, in, jar, in clay jars uh, in order to protect them from moisture and from molding because uh, they were written on the skins of goats and uh, you had to take really good care of them if you wanted to um, keep your book <laughs> that you had had copied. So that is another thing to remember. Okay, so I've addressed the whole thing. Now, 
Um, concerning the exile, this is my last comment about that for now, before we jump into um, going verse by verse. Before, um, what happened is at the time of the destruction of the first temple and the exile when all the people that left Jerusalem, they were deported, they took the scrolls with them, okay? And because they left the land, they left behind a sense of understanding the context in which the word was originally given. Because most of the word of God was given right here in the land. That's why we call it the land of the Bible. And there is a context to be experienced. It's a context that includes the, just the, the visuals, the, the, the smells, the, the, the rain, the sun, the wind, the dust, the, um, the night, the day, the, the movement of the stars, the moon, the movement of the clouds, the, the dew fall. It goes on and on and on. And in order to really understand what's going on in scripture, you kind of have to be here <laughs> to, to, to really understand it. And so what happened was the Bible went into exile along with the Jewish people. And the big exile, of course, was after the destruction of the second temple, where the Bible went into exile for 2,000 years. And there was a loss of language. There was a loss of the real um, liveliness of the language uh, of Hebrew. It was only uh, used in the synagogues, and they were only reading from scripture. So there was no... Um, daytime chat or uh, deep conversation or business or anything done in the Hebrew language. It was all done in the language uh, where Jews were exiled. And so the, the understanding of the Bible and the geographical understanding. So uh, 2000 years, that's, that really um, counts for a lot of generations who did not have the firsthand experience of being here in the land. And so uh, beginning, beginning around um, the turn of the uh, 20th century when Jews began to return to the land, this is before the birth of the state of Israel, there was suddenly um, a rebirth, like a renaissance of the Hebrew language as a language that you use for your life. And uh, it, it was uh, all compiled into dictionaries by a man by the name of Eliezer ben Yehuda. And uh, people began to speak it in their homes and newspapers, they started to print newspapers. And so the Hebrew began to flow again. And once again, uh, people began to start to study the Bible in relationship to the land in which it had been given. And new discoveries were made. And then of course was the the birth of the whole um, archaeological research that goes on in this country by the Jewish people, the rebirth of the language by the Jewish people, and the rebirth of the study of the Bible by the Jewish people. And it was like uh, the, God returned them to the land, but he also returned the Bible to the land. And that's why it's so exciting nowadays to be here because of the continual discoveries that are being made uh, week by week, week by week. And there are discoveries being made in the language itself. And uh, so I just wanted to um, share that with you because the gospel of John has returned to the land. And we are now as Messianic Jews, we're, uh, we are beginning to rediscover the gospels in their real context and not in the context of the nations where and you know thousands of commentaries have been written in all different languages but uh, there is something to be discovered by 
actually doing the research here in the land. So I hope that you can understand that and hopefully you're going to understand it by, by the way we go through uh, the verses. So I've divided the chapter up into the, um, the introduction, which is called a prologue. And then there is introducing John the Baptist and the world at that time. And then the birth of Jesus. There's a whole Christmas account that's hidden in John's special language. And then there's the testimony of John the Baptist. There's an interrogation done by the Pharisees. And then there's the baptism of Jesus, followed by the call of the disciples and the call of Philip and Nathanael, Nathaniel. So um, now when we get to the beginning of John, the very first verse, it says, in the beginning. Now that's pretty easy to understand, in the beginning, and you immediately think of Genesis 1. What do you think about that? Do you, do you, uh, is that when you read in the beginning, how do you, um, pastor, how do you, um, feel about that or how does that resonate with you on one level in the beginning but the, the world everything on another level in the beginning Jesus the word mm -hmm. okay so John's intention here John's intention is to link us to the actual creation account. Mm -hmm. He wants us in the creation account, which is, it's called parasha bereshit, the portion called bereshit, because this is the first Bible portion read by the Jewish people at the beginning of a reading cycle. What, uh, every year we begin reading, once again, we read through the whole Bible and we begin, uh, it's right after the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, we begin uh, the Bible again and we begin with Parasha Bereshit. And so he wants to draw us into that Parasha into Bereshit. Bereshit means um, in the beginning. Okay. Now, it gets lost in the Greek. It's ente arche, which is in the beginning, but it doesn't, it doesn't take you where John wants to take you. And we have to remember, John was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee and speaking mostly Aramaic and Hebrew on Shabbat. And probably they were mixing, uh, which is very prevalent today in Israel because we have so many languages being spoken here that we mix Hebrew, Arabic, or Hebrew and English, uh, Arabic and English. And uh, it's, it's a very, almost everybody does it. Everybody, uh, mixes Hebrew or their mother tongue Arabic. Those are the two top lang languages with another language. So John most likely was a kind of bilingual Galilean fisherman. And most likely he did not speak any Greek because they were out of the trade centers. And so he's speaking these two languages. So he knows because all um, Hebrew boys at that time, uh, if they lived in a town with a synagogue, uh, which he did, Bethsaida, they learned the Bible. They learned it by heart. And they learned it by the parasha. So 
by beginning his gospel with a parasha of creation, he's drawing us in to tell us that he's going to be referring to different parashot along the way. And he's going to draw Jesus into the, into the Hebrew scriptures. Usually what takes place in the, um, the other three gospels called the synoptics is that they quote from the Hebrew scriptures, mm -hmm. the messianic prophecies. That's the classical way that they refer but john is doing something different here he's not necessarily quoting but he'll throw out um, like a word bomb and that word bomb is going to explode and it's going to take you right into the hebrew scriptures because he's taking it for granted that almost everybody who is hearing his account knows what he's talking about mm -hmm. so that's the first thing is he's drawing us into the creation account and that's really important uh, for us to understand so <laughs> that's the very first thing that happens here now um, i would like you just to read um, genesis 1 um, let's see, uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word Gen was God. Genesis first. first oh, Genesis, first Genesis. Um, John, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we'll go, and then we'll have you read from John. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm a I'm all prepared for John. <laughs> okay, Genesis 1, 1 to 4, yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Okay, so here we see, we see God dividing, and we see that the light enters into the picture, and we see the Spirit of God in the picture. So all very important things that are going to pop up in his uh, very first verses. So now let's have you read um, verse one through four in John. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Okay, so what is that saying to you? To begin, For uh, me? to begin, yes, yes, of course. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the beginning was the word, so Got well, it's saying that, as you said, right to the beginning of creation, we're going right back there, and he's linking Jesus with all of that. So he's letting us know that Jesus was in the very beginning, and God spoke everything that was into being. So, oh. am I going too fast? No, no, you're saying something great that uh, I'm going to jump on later. <laughs> finish, finish. The, the, um, Everything was in the very, very beginning. Everything was out form, without form and void, darkness. It was, it was chaos in the right. very beginning. But God spoke into all that. The word, let there be light, and there was light. Then we come into the New Testament, and we see the word again, 
the word of God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So um, John here is linking Jesus at the very beginning. So we're, we're establishing that it, it is even before his birth. Right. Um, all things were made through him. So, he's a, he's a, so Jesus is associated with all of that. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And Jesus is the light. Right. So and God, yeah. <laughs> what does light do with darkness? It dispels the darkness. It illuminates. So the, the darkness goes. You can't have darkness and light. So when light comes, the darkness goes. So in the beginning was darkness. Mm -hmm. And God spoke and there became light. Okay. So let's work on what you just said. You said God spoke, okay? And then there was light. Now, this is, this, is, uh, this is where we're going to jump off the deep end of the pool. <laughs> when John says the word, he is referring to something that they had an understanding. Those Galilean fishermen had an understanding that the word wasn't, the word was very special. It represented uh, God in a way that was um, active you know, that brings forth the light into the darkness and then gets rid of all the chaos and brings order. Okay, so you've heard, everybody's heard the word logos, right? You've heard the word. So that's uh, the Greek translation of the word logos. Now, the, the meaning of logos is great and fine. And uh, it's used everywhere. You you know, logos bookstore, logos software, logos this, logos that. But you've probably, have you ever heard of the word memra? Memra. Can't say so. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to memra. This is what John understood. He was not thinking logos he was thinking memra in the beginning there is sheet there was this memra now memra was used um like the voice of god and memra is applied to uh, god giving a command god applying his will, God teaching, God giving wisdom, God inspiring, God's power, God's protection. And throughout um, the law of Moses, when you read the law of Moses in the Aramaic, which was a translation from Hebrew, and what they were doing in the time of uh, Jesus was in the synagogues because many of the people um, could not speak Hebrew and could hardly understand Hebrew. They had to have a translation when the word was being preached because the preaching would be done in Hebrew. And so the translation took place and along with the translators came interpretation and that those interpretations were compiled into what's known as targums it this began in the in the babylonian exile and maybe even a little before and so there's a whole uh, there's a whole bible in biblical aramaic that has 
vocabulary in it that is characteristically, uniquely Aramaic. And memra, it means word. It means word, but it's a word that is active. Um, like um, you've heard the word rhema, haven't you? Yes. It's more like rhema. It's not, um, logos is way too benign for memra. Memra is very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the first, I'm going to just mention a few scriptures uh, to kind of help you to understand the, uh, the character of memra. Um, it's first used when after the fall, after Adam and Eve eat the uh, fruit off the tree of knowledge and fall um, uh, into what we understand as original sin, God comes looking for them. And they are hearing the voice of the Lord. They are hearing the memra of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a representation. It is the Lord, but it is the dynamic of the Lord. So John is referring to Jesus as the memra. Now, uh, we move on through Genesis and we get to uh, Noah. And of course, he builds the ark and then the flood comes and then uh, they're in the ark and then the dry land appears. And finally, Noah steps out of the ark and he has an encounter with God and God makes a covenant with him. And it is the memra. He, the covenant is made with the memra. <laughs> it's a very, very interesting concept that does not appear in our Western thinking at all. Mm -hmm. But it is the presence of God. It is the voice of God. It is the covenant action of God. God always in, in Genesis, when he's making a covenant, he, uh, the memra is present. Now, it's not always, uh, memra is not always used, but always when a covenant is being made by God. When he makes the coven covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, it's the memra. Abraham is making a covenant with the memra of God. Um, Sometimes the memra will appear in dreams, like to Avi Melech uh, when he's supposed to uh, let Sarah go. Um, even the memra appears to Ishmael and helps him to grow up. So it's a guiding word. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, a nourishing word. It's a word of warning. It's a word that makes covenant. And, um, and it's a confirming word. So uh, this is actually the, the action of God that Jesus actually becomes the representative action of God, the voice of God. So Jesus, John is actually saying that Jesus is the memra in, in this. He's not saying Jesus is the logos because he didn't know Greek. He's, he's thinking memra. Okay. So I have a whole host of references to memra being used throughout the law of Moses, which are the first five books. And um, so he's, he's explaining that when God speaks and says, let there be light, that's the memra in action. And so John is saying, this is with God. The memra is with God. The memra is God. Jesus is the memra. And he is with the Lord. And he is the Lord. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that, um, is that digestible? Very. Yes. Good for the okay. planet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is first century understanding of that word mm -hmm. okay and it's such an amazing word um 
and you would only un you would only come to understand it if you uh, were encountering the second language of the people of that time of the Israelite Jewish people. Um, Aramaic was the second language and it was being used in scripture. Um, Daniel chapter two until verse seven, it's all in Aramaic. There are portions in Ezekiel and so forth where you, you're reading Aramaic. So it's not that far from Hebrew. It's just another kind of sister language which developed at the same time that Hebrew did uh, way back when. It's a it's a language that was used by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, until Alexander the Great, around uh, 3, 330 uh, BC. But Jews continued to use Aramaic all the way until today. Mm -hmm. um, it's being used in this country. And even uh, there is a new movement in this country with Israelis who are from Iraqi background that they are retrieving their Aramaic language as a second language. So there is a, an interesting movement going on there. Okay, so we understand that this whole thing of the creation, the Bereshit, the beginning uh, is the Memra. Okay, so let us let us go uh, why don't you read verse 4 and let verse 4 through 8 in him was life and the life was the light of man and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Okay, so we have, John is mentioning that the light is in the darkness and the darkness can't comprehend it. So immediately, bong, you go to Isaiah because Isaiah is mentioning two places. And I, first I'd like you to read in Isaiah nine. That's actually where we're going is Isaiah nine. And uh, verse one and two. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed as when the at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. And the people walked in darkness, and the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So here we go. We actually see that Jesus coming into Galilee and ministering in Galilee that Isaiah prophesies about. John does not quote this scripture, but he refers to this scripture because he talks about John and that John is a witness to the light. Mm. Okay? So this is how John is working. Do you, do you uh, catch that? Yeah. yeah. Is that clear? John yeah. is not, he's not quoting, but he's, he's constantly throwing out these little triggers Mm. so that the person who is um, hearing the gospel um, is going to immediately think, oh, okay, yeah, Isaiah, uh, Galilee of the Gentiles. 
ah, yes, that was very dark place. And when Jesus came into it, a light is shining. And that pretty much describes his whole Galilean ministry right there. That um, verse, Isaiah 1 and 2. Mm. And then the second one, um, let's see, uh, is Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2, 3. 1, 2, and 3. Isaiah 60. Rise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Of course, this speaks about Jesus. Mm. Nobody else um, would have um, the glory so that the Gentiles would come to him and kings would recognize him. Um, but it's also a, um, an encouragement to us uh, as his disciples. <laughs> and, and it's a very good word for this time. It's yeah. a very good word. So um, John, he is bearing witness to the light. So he is um, actually being like Isaiah. And later on, he's going to actually identify himself uh, with Isaiah the prophet. Um, but let's go to verse 9 in uh, John. Let's go to verse 9 in John. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Okay, so this is the only way that we can walk in this world. And uh, read verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Right. And then uh, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Okay, this is, this is really um, powerful because he creates the world, you know, the, the world is created through him, but the world doesn't know him. You know, how can that possibly be? The only way the world, that someone in the world can know him is through the light that he shines. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. Do you have anything to, you want to add in, to thread in? So it's very clear that John is addressing the Jew, the Jewish people. So they'd have an right. understanding of, of where, where he's coming from. And right. So, so he's, he's actually saying to them, the light came to you and you <laughs> did not know him. Right. They're, they're in so, darkness. They don't, they don't know their own Messiah. Exactly. And the world, what is this world? He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. So the world is beyond the Jews. It's, it's the whole, the whole makeup mm -hmm. of who we are and what we're a part of doesn't recognize him. Right. In John's time, there were nations. Uh, his world, the world that he knew, there were nations to the north of him, to the east of him, across the, the Yamagado, the, the great Mediterranean, um, Asia Minor, Rome, of course, the Roman Empire. That was the world 
at that time. So it was a, uh, um, a conglomerate of nations and the nation uh, in the land of Israel. Um, but nobody, nobody knew, knew him. him. No, not even his own. Yeah. Absolutely nobody knew him. Right. And that is startling when you start to think about it. Even his own own home, even in Nazareth, mm. they couldn't recognize him. Okay. Let's just um, back that up with um, a scripture. <laughs> the fact that, and here again, this is a trigger because he's saying um, that he was not received by his own. Um, he was basically rejected. So let's go to Isaiah 6. And I want you to read Isaiah 6, 8 through 10. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. So there is a strange kind of situation that Isaiah prophesies um, over the people Israel, over the Jewish people. Now, they're not called the Jewish people, by the way, uh, yet. They're called the people Israel in, in the time of Isaiah. And then Paul, of course, he mentions it in uh, Romans chapter 11. He talks about the rejection and he quotes Isaiah uh, in verse 8, Romans chapter 11 and verse 8. Yes, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor eyes that they should not see and ears they should not hear to this very day. So that's really, it's very poignant because you think, well, Lord, what's going on here? You know, centuries, uh, century after century, millennium after millennium, and this is going on. Um, but uh, let's read a little tiny bit of hope in this and that is uh, also in Romans chapter 11 uh, just read in uh, 15 um, let's see read from 11 uh, to the end of uh, 15 11 to the end of 15 I say then have they stumbled that they should fall certainly not but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches from the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh to jealousy, some of them, for if their being cast away is the reconciled of the world, that will their acceptance be but life from the dead? The question he's asking. Yes. He's asking it, but he's actually... Um implying that it's going mm. to take place. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it gives us hope. It gives us hope because it's really a strange mystery. I don't know about you, but um, 
I certainly think it's a strange mystery for, for us to endure all of this history, mm. to go through what we've gone through, two exiles. Now we're restored to the land of Israel. And the Bible is coming alive once again, really coming alive this time. And there are believers in the land. But, you know, the pace is so far for us from our perspective, our peanut gallery perspective. Yeah. It, the pace is really slow. Mm. Uh, watching our people continue in this darkness, this, mm. you know. So that's our prayer. But we go on and we read some really Im important things in John. Uh, let's read um, verse 13. Yes, just verse 13 in John 1. Okay. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Oh, sorry, 12 and 13. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, here's something really exciting and surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you read, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to, to become, become the children of God. It's the word is in Aramaic and in Greek, authority. Authority. I, I like that word authority. <laughs> so read it again using the word authority. But as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. There's nothing like all that authority. Right. Now, what does that say to you? How, do, how does that speak to you? But as many as received him, to so everyone who comes to him, so were the Jews making a big thing about them being the chosen ones and having all the rights, um, non-Jews, Gentiles could feel like they can't, they can't have a part, an inheritance in, in, in what God has through Jesus Christ. But John is saying, but it's, it's gone beyond all of that now. It's gone beyond that nationhood. Because of what Jesus Christ has done and who he is being the light, all who have, um, as many as receive him, to them, God has given the authority, the right. So I, I can rightfully say I'm a child of God. Amen. I'm, I'm coming into the commonwealth, as it were, of Israel, the nation yes. of Israel. And it's because God's given me the authority through Jesus. That is really exciting. Right. Now, when you think about authority, I find this to be a very weighty word. I feel like, oh my goodness, he's giving me authority to be his child. That means, you know, I'm, I'm now a, I'm an inheritor. I'm, uh, because I'm a child, I'm, I'm his child and I have responsibility. That's the thing. Uh, maybe it's because I'm a firstborn. <laughs> I think this way. So am I. We've got something in common there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, you know, all, I always think about responsibility. Yeah. So that goes along with authority because to really exercise true authority, one has to be very, very responsible mm. um, to that authority. But it's also and, understanding the authority as well, isn't it? Yes. Yes. To be able to exercise it. Right. So all of us in this Bible study, we need to think about that, like, Lord, what is this authority that you've given us? Mm. You know, maybe, um, um, I don't know about you, but I've, you know, I've gone through years of sort of 
saying, well, you know, I'm not qualified or, you know, I need to be more qualified or I need to learn and train and um, I'm not ready yet. No, you know, <laughs> I go on and on because I really don't feel I'm ready to assume the responsibility or the author or to take authority, you know. Um, so, you know, I've spent many years that way, but God is working on me mm -hmm. slowly but surely. And uh, <laughs> yeah, after... we all initially do really, isn't that? Yeah. Especially, if, especially if you're called by God, you think, yes, you, you think the task is too much. How could God call me? How can God use me? There's far better people, far, people know far more than me. I think, I think it's you see it all the time, right? Something we, we, we wrestle with, we never feel qualified, we never feel we know enough, right? So then the Lord asks us to step out because He's the one, He knows when we're ready to exercise. The yeah. authority we have the authority but we have to learn how to exercise yeah. the authority shouldn't we yeah yeah and that's where we have that's where we fall down because to exercise that authority is like the eagle jumping yes. out in the unknown with god if god if god says you can do it you can do right. it it's not it's nothing to do with right. you, you can or not because it's not actually you doing it mm -hmm. it's him doing it and so he obviously knows you're ready to exercise it because he's, he's, he's brought you through um, his school, as it were. Yes. He knows when you're ready to do whatever he says. He's prepared you, but you might not have necessarily have known you've gone through that training. It hasn't been that apparent to you. Right. But to God, he knows. He knows when you're yeah. ready. And that uh, you uh, have to be obedient and, and act in faith. Right. Right. Total trust in his divine abilities, because it's not about us, it's him working through us. Yes. So you're, you're, uh, God is speaking through you to all of us tonight in the Bible study concerning this word about authority. This is, this is really an important thing for us uh, in this Bible study, I think. It's like mm. uh, something that the Lord wants to give us to think about and the pray over okay let's go and have christmas in verse 14. <laughs> the word becomes flesh <laughs> yes shall i read down to 18 or just 14. uh yeah let's um yes read 14 through 18 and then um i'm going to ask for the slide at one point and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Okay, there's lots in this passage now. So get ready. <laughs> uh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the word became flesh. Okay. That is the account of the birth of Jesus. We read it in Matthew. Uh, we read it in Luke. Those, that's where we read the, the um, accounts of his birth and all the things that surrounded it, the shepherds and uh, the trip down to Bethlehem from Nazareth and uh, finding a place to stay and uh, the taxation and all the, the whole drama of the thing mm -hmm. was uh, tremendous. And so we've just recently, of course, um, celebrated his, his birth 
Um, and so we come, we come to the next thing. And that is, it says, the word became flesh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay, here's going to be a big accordion. Dwelt. He dwelt among us. Okay. So Isaiah chapter seven and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, here's some Hebrew for you. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is yeah. with us. Ima. Iman is with us, mm -hmm. El, Imanu, and with us. Okay, God with us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is a messianic prophecy. John does not quote it. He only refers to it. He alludes to it. Mm -hmm. The next thing is the dwelling. I want to dwell on the dwelling because for God to dwell with us, takes us right back into the book of Exodus. And we want to look in um, Exodus 33, verse 7 through 11, where this is the building of God's dwelling place for the Israelites who have come out of Egypt. Okay, so this is about the tent of the meeting. Exodus 33, yes. 7 through 11. Yes. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle to, of the meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Okay, thank you. So... The word, you keep hearing the word tabernacle, 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 tabernacle. Okay, here we go. Here's some Hebrew. Get ready for some Hebrew. Okay, the root of tabernacle is uh, S-H-K-H-N. Shachen. Shachen or shachan, or shachen. shachen. Okay, that means to dwell, okay? That means to dwell. So John is thinking of this word, shachen, and the name of the tabernacle is the mishkan, mishkan, M-I-S-H, K H A N, Mish Khan. And that is where the presence of the Lord dwelt. And of course, there was the pillar of cloud in the day and the pillar of fire by night. And then John is saying um, that God, um, let's see. The word became flesh. Can you read it again? 14, John 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so now go to Exodus 40. 34 through 38. And this is what John is referring to. Exodus 40, 34, 38. The covering of ram skins dyed red, the covering of badger skins, and the veil of the covering, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat the table, all its utensils, and the showbread, the pure gold lampstand with its lamps, the lamps set in order, all its utensils, and the oil of light, the gold altar, the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, the screen for the tabernacle door. 34 um, through 38. 34 through 38. Exodus 40. Oh gosh, no, sorry. My error. But that's I'm okay. Gonna, we got I'm we got to get a little bit of the furniture. I've, yeah, I turned i turned um, too early. Sorry. Forces. No, it's good because we got to hear a little bit. Yeah. The cloud of the glory and the glory. Yeah. Yes. Then the cloud cover the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in, in, onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the, the day that it was taken up for the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So this is what John is, he's referring to this as beholding God's glory. God, okay. Uh, God is getting born in uh, Jesus in Bethlehem. And then he, he says this because, I mean, this is an amazing thing to say we beheld his glory. When you think of that, you think of something really immense and powerful and uh, uh, overwhelming. And what are the adjectives for, for seeing God's glory? You know, what are the adjectives? I mean, <laughs> we fall down on our faces. English is um, too, too weak. Yeah. So he uses this image of the tabernacle in the wilderness of Israel beholding the glory of the Lord in the Mishkan, the Mishkan, and uh, as an example of how we are to behold um, Jesus. Okay, so there's so much in this verse 14. I'm not even done yet. Uh, <laughs> now we want to deal with, okay, the word became flesh and dwelt. Okay, Mishkan. Then we be beheld his glory. Vekavod Adonai male et Mishkan. The glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. Okay, then it says, uh, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, now, grace and truth is a very common biblical phrase. So I want to teach it to you. Um, this is a good it's, it's a good phrase to know. Uh, the first word, grace, is chesed. So I think you would, because um, there's a little bit of a soft ch there, chesed, 
which would be K-H-E-S-E-D, chesed. That is grace um, and loving kindness. That is the word we find in Hebrew scripture for grace. And then um, following chesed, you have and truth. So and is ve, V-E, and then truth is emet, E-M-E-T. So the, the phrase is chesed ve-emet, grace and truth. Very common in the Hebrew scriptures. So once again, John is referring to something that's pretty familiar to everybody. Chesed ve'emet. So I want you to turn to Psalm 85. Um, 85, yeah. Mm -hmm. Verse, um, I like verse 10 as a kind of intro. So read verse 10 through the end of the psalm to 14, including 14. Oh, yeah, I love this one. I love this portion of scripture. <laughs> Mercy and truth have met together. Yes. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. There you go. That pretty much describes what John is saying about Jesus. Chesed ve'emet. If he he could have said chesed and something else. But when he said chesed ve'emet, you immediately have to come to this psalm. That's just the way it is. <laughs> and if you think, uh, just imagine yourself as a first century Jewish girl uh, or lady, and you hear someone say chesed ve'emet, you're going to know right away. Oh, good. And then you can probably recite the whole thing uh, from memory. Because not, people were not distracted by everything uh, back in those days. They were just uh, can, you know, focusing on their work with their sheep and goats and uh, olive trees and fig trees and... Um, harvesting and plowing and whatever and uh, so they had and the word of god was the only other thing that they focused on and so to their advantage they knew it by heart and so john is taking he's taking it for granted that everybody understands what he's saying now here we are in our day where we uh, unfortunately haven't memorize the whole bible mm -hmm. so and the hebrew scriptures especially and uh, that's one of the points i'm making is in order to really understand john you really need to find those associations really quickly in order to know what he's talking about uh, and that's an encouragement to us um, it's uh, it's an encouragement to me and i hope it is uh, to you that uh, you know, let's uh, apply our time uh, whenever we can, even though we're busy um, uh, managing our households or helping other people with households um, that, uh, and work, of course, that somehow we manage to get as much, <laughs> much scripture it to ourselves as possible yeah. so we can understand these gospels mm. um, uh, and understand the writers as well understand their mentality understand their excitement about jesus and how they are using 
their Bible to tell us 2,000 years later. Uh, and I, I think I'm always amazed at that. You know, I, I sit in amazement um, about that reality. Okay, so John is very, oh, I want to mention one thing. In, let's see. Okay, verse 17, and um, it says, the, for the law was given through Moses. Here in the New King James, you see it's in italics, but, but's in italics. It's not in, it's not in the manuscripts. Okay. There's no but. And so now I want to look at the, the slide, if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, How, how do we do that? You there, Clint? You putting it out? Yeah, just getting it up now. Oh, okay. So we wanted we want to drop the butt from that, mm -hmm. and then we're, I drew a little picture for us. <laughs> and so this is a uh, this is this could be a first century house. Uh, many of the first century houses in this land had red tile roofs. Um, and if they didn't, they, it was just a square house like you see. And so I want to use the house as a sort of picture of the Hebrew scriptures and, uh, and how they are founded on the rock. You know, uh, the Lord speaks about that in his parable of building the house on the rock. And you see they're like steps. That's actually the limestone strata of Nazareth. That's how um, buildings were built in Nazareth. They literally built on the bedrock. So this is a kind of schematic uh, picture of the geology of Nazareth and the mountains. And so Yeshua, Jesus is the rock. Okay, now the foundation of Hebrew scriptures is called the law of Moses, or in Hebrew, it's called the Torah, okay? And so that is like the foundation of the house, which is connected to the bedrock. And then we have, uh, above that bedrock, we have the prophets. And so those windows and the door, that's the way into scripture, which is through the prophets, because they, kind of um, uh, bring everything alive uh, from the Torah. And then you go up into the roof of the, not the roof, but the, bef the before the roof. Now, if the, the red tiles weren't there, that would be the roof, the Psalms or the writings. And so that's all the worship that goes up to God. You know, that's that's the whole part of, of uh, scripture that worship and is offered up to the Lord. And then the roof itself that covers the whole thing is the chesed and the met, chesed ve'emet, the grace and the truth. So without the grace and the truth, you really can't, um, first of all, the house would be all flooded and you know, it would be a mess inside. There, there would be no order. There would be chaos. You have to have a roof on your house. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is the one. First of all, he is the rock. He is the foundation upon which the house is built, the Hebrew scriptures. But he's also the roof that covers the scriptures so we can understand it. Uh, if we didn't have that roof there, we wouldn't be understanding we wouldn't be able to understand the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't really read the word of God. And that is the, the um, prophecy in Jeremiah 31, 31, where it, it says that he's going to establish uh, the new covenant. Um, and I, let, let's have you read that. That would, that would be good. Um, let's go to Jeremiah. Let's see. I'm 31. okay let's 
Jeremiah 31. 31. Thank you, Clint. Uh, Jeremiah 31. And then it says down here. Um, hold on. Where he makes a new covenant? Yes. Uh, yes. So 31 uh, to the end of 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. So the Lord has promised us through the new covenant, the new covenant, that we're going to be able to understand these scriptures. We're going to understand his word. And uh, we, won't, we won't really need anybody to teach it to us or explain it to us because when we read it we'll be able to understand it and that's an exciting thing because they're talking about the holy spirit mm -hmm. and of course john is already um, introducing us to the holy spirit in this first chapter and that means that we are going to have a comprehension and understanding um, of the word of God and who Jesus is. So that moves us then over to the testimony of John. And um, let's start in verse 19. Now we'll probably move quicker than we have been moving. Uh, there are just certain topics that we'll address mm -hmm. and then we can do question and answer so starting in verse 19 um, uh, down through 24 now this is a testimony of john when the jews sent priests and levites from jerusalem to ask him who are you he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. That we, what do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. Okay. So now we're getting into um, some of the real rubber hits the road reality of uh, this time in which the, John is um, speaking where Jesus is about to uh, appear on the scene and to be baptized. And so John is being introduced and that is really important because he's, uh, John, John the apostle is introducing John the Baptist even in the beginning comments of the Memra, and then now he's introducing him and he's putting him in the context of the interrogation that's being done by the, by the um, 
priests, the Levites, and the Pharisees. Okay, so a quick comment on that. There were four different groups of people among all of the people Israel in that time. And they were um, from different districts. Now we've been talking about Galilee, but now we're going to start talking about Judea. <clears throat> okay, so they are asking him um, a list of questions that have to do with the Messiah. Uh, the first question they ask is, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I'm not the Messiah. Then they're asking him, are you Elijah? Now, Elijah, everybody knows if you're a first century um, Jew or an Israelite, because I'm still dividing them into districts, that in the book of Malachi, um, in chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, why don't you read that to us? This is a description of Elijah, the, this special figure. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Okay. And then in the very end, in uh, chapter four, um, in verse five. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay, so they're asking in Jerusalem, they're saying, are you Elijah? The Elijah that's mentioned in the book of Malachi. Okay, so uh, to understand it. And then they say, are you the prophet? Now, here is a messianic prophecy found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 18. And I will give you the references. Okay. Um, this is uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Mm -hmm. And through 18. Yeah, 15 through 19, sorry. Okay. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that, that whoever will hear, will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require of him. Okay, so this is a messianic prophecy. Um, John doesn't quote it, but he mentions that they're asking John the Baptist, are you the prophet, the prophet? When you hear the prophet, you know it's Deuteronomy 18. Okay. So, but then John says, 
Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 5. So can you read that for us? Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 5. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. Okay, so that was what John was doing. He was down there in the Jordan River. Uh, and it says that he was beyond uh, the Jordan on the other side in an area called Beit Avra, which is just north of the Dead Sea. Um, I don't know if we've been there together or not as a group, um, but we've passed by it many a time. Um, the traditional baptism site, of course, is there. Um, so anyway, he's there. And uh, you know, it's not exactly the most comfortable place in the world, even though it is the Jordan River. And he is crying out to the people and he's calling them to repent um, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's preparing them for when Jesus comes. Okay. And he's now let's uh, let's talk about baptism. Um, there is, according to the law of Moses, in Leviticus chapter 15, I'm not going to turn to it, but I want to mention verse 13, which is um, living pure water. Now, anybody that had any kind of uncleanness, um, a kind of um, issue of, you know, pus or something from your body, um, there are many, uh, the whole chapter 15 pretty much categorizes all the different uh, modes of uncleanness in that community at that time that they had to wash with water. Um, and they usually had to wash at sundown with water to become clean. And then it's specified uh, what kind of water and it's living water and living water in those days in the time of Jesus was um, either a river or a stream or a spring or a um, an immersion bath that would have a source of water that could be covered and kept clean. So not far from there, of course, we had the, uh, the place of um, the priests at Qumran, uh, who were the scribes of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were immersing on a daily basis before they would cleanse themselves, before they would go and work as scribes copying uh, the books of the Bible. So it's very important. The word baptize, you know, we think when we think baptize, we think, oh, okay, uh, we go to a river or um, a body of water or um, a baptism tank or whatever, or, or the sea, mm -hmm. and um, we baptize that person, um, and uh, you know, according to Romans 6. But uh, in John's time, this was not baptism like we understand it's purification from uncleanness and sin so he's doing a ceremonial symbolic action of being cleansed from sin before the real mm -hmm. atonement comes who is going to be um in verse um well i'm in deuteronomy we're going back to John now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's um, in verse 29, the Lamb of God. Okay. We're going to. Um, yeah. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so why don't you read that last portion, 29 through 34? That's going to be the end of the lesson for today. And we'll just address a, a couple of things and then question and answer. And the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel before I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit ascending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. I did not know him for he was who sent him to me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the son of God. Okay, so this, this is the account of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. And this is how John presents it. Number one, it's the Lamb of God. Okay, so that immediately takes us back to Passover. It takes us back to the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts of the houses as the, the final plague of the 10 plagues, the, the uh, death of the firstborn uh, passes over Egypt and kills all the firstborn while all of the Israelite slaves are hiding in the houses covered by the blood of the Lamb of God. And so Jesus uh, in the last Passover is the one, the Lamb of God, who is taken to the cross and dies on the cross, shedding his blood to cleanse us, to atone for us, and cleanses us from all sin. And uh, so, of course, we're going to, when we go farther in John, we're going to really address the atonement and the shedding of blood and so forth. But John announces Behold, the Lamb of God. He's the one who's going to take your sin away. Not me with the water in the river here. That's not going to do anything. That's just to help you get focused. He's the one who's going to do it. And not only that, he's going to bring the Holy Spirit to you. So, or the Holy Spirit is going to come to you through him. And of course, we have that image of the dove and uh, and then the final um, the the final uh, declaration that he is the son of God. That mm. is the essence of epiphany, the revelation that Jesus is the son of God. Mm. So that ties him up with the father, takes him, takes us back to the beginning of the chapter. Uh, that the word was with God, the memra was with God, the memra was God. Okay, so amen and amen, amen. for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. That was that was really excellent, um, Pamela. And that That's really, a lot of material. <laughs> that was really that, that was really studying the Bible and the set aside this. Uh, two hours every month to do just that um, and that has been amazing just going through that just looking deeper and getting that and getting a clear understanding um, as John is speaking to the Jews and unfolding things to them uh, and you have to have that understanding otherwise it's not going to make sense to us um, did you don't have a, a few minutes for for questions and answers, if anyone has any questions. Do you want to do that now, Pamela? Yes, I'd love, I love questions, you know that. <laughs> okay, so I'll give people opportunity, if you have um, a question. Um, I don't know how we're gonna do this. If you have a go in gallery, um, if you, I'll try to see you all, it's a bit difficult, but I'll try to see as many as I can. If you have a question, if you, well, I would say put your hand up, but because I only see one 
one page at a time may be a bit difficult, but if you just say, um, I have a question, what your name is, and then say unmute and do that, and then ask Pam the question. We'll see how that works. Anyone got a question? <laughs> Is Amal, okay, Amal, I see Amal. Unmute Amal. You know, when, you know in the, when you read um, about Genesis 1, when you read in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, about the light that he spoke and there was light. And then we went back to book of John and it says in the beginning, there was a word. And then that word, uh, Emma, uh, Memma? Mem Memra. Memra, Memra. Is it somehow like in, in the beginning, there was a word that means it already existed because of the light that was in the Old Testament. So here's the word that became flesh. Does that mean the, and then you mentioned about the world did not know him, nation. Is it because the light was spoken and in the book of John, in the beginning was the word, it means it already existed. The word already existed. Is it to do with the Old Testament? because you gave Pastor Rosemary to read the Old Testament and then right. the, the New Testament of Book of John. Does that mean they're related together? Yes, that's, that's um, the whole, that's the method of John. That's how John works. So he's taking the Old Testament um, from the Torah, from the Book of Genesis, and he's tying it to his gospel. And he's saying, Look, everybody, that um, God spoke and he said, let there be light. And there was light and the light uh, peer, uh, came into the darkness. I'm, I'm mixing yeah. up John and Genesis. And in John, it says, yes, um, the light came uh, into the darkness and the darkness could not comprehend it. So John is saying the darkness had to go when the light was spoken by God out of God's mouth, God's voice, Memra, and Jesus is the expression of the Lord that we can see, like in another place, I believe it's in Colossians, that he is the image of God. Mm -hmm. So it's another way of saying um, who Jesus is. So John wants us to understand that Jesus is already right there at the beginning in Genesis. He's taking us to meet Jesus in Genesis when he is um, speaking his gospel or writing his gospel. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. Anyone else has a question? Just unmute and just say your question. I think that silence is just how thorough you were, Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot of material and, uh, you know, I'm going to ponder it all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have been pondering and I will ponder, you know, it's very, very deep, um, John's gospel. All right, I see Pauline, Pauline Richards put her hand up. Thank you, Reverend Taylor, all I wanted, um, Pamela, could you just recap for me on two words that I wasn't sure about and the spelling was, oh, okay. you said, is it Logos? Yes, and, Logos. And Logos and mm -hmm. Nim Nimra? Memra. 
Memra. Uh, M-E-M-R-A. Okay. Logos is L-O-G-O-S. Okay. And you can put um, equals, equals, right. yeah. Memra, M-E-M-R-A, Memra. Right. Okay. And that meant it was what, the voice of God, did you say? Yes, the voice okay. of God. I have a, um, a definition here. Yeah. Uh, um, memra is thought in the sense of command, will, teaching, wisdom, inspiration, power and protection. Wow. Perfect. Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> Is that Vivica put your hand up? Did you put your hand up, Vivica? Yes, I have. Okay. 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 Hello. Um, I'd just like to ask a question. It's from Deuteronomy uh, 18, verse 15 where it says, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. My question is, how did they know that Jesus was the prophet? Because there were other prophets, like Jeremiah and all sorts of prophets that were, that, you know, God used from the time of Moses. I'm a little bit complex with that one. Okay, so first of all, this prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, um, from 15 to um, 19, uh, is actually a messianic prophecy. It speaks about someone that will come that will be able to speak the word of the Lord. Now, that is one aspect of who the Messiah is, who... Um, the Christ is. So going all the way back, um, you know, three and a half thousand years ago, um, this is appearing in the law of Moses as a messianic prophecy and is not really recognized until maybe 2,500 years ago. So um, a time had to pass before they recognized that this wasn't just a prophet, this was the prophet. So we get to the time of Jesus and you have these religious leaders in Judea, in the province of Judea. And in some translations, um, these religious leaders in Judea are known as the Jews in John. It's Sometimes it appears in the translation. Um, and it uh, here in, in uh, John uh, 1 verse 19, it says, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites. That doesn't mean Jews. It means eudaios in Greek. It means those in Judea who were in the religious leadership and they sent emissaries down to the Jordan River from Jerusalem to find out if John the Baptist was the prophet. And you had a lot of this chatter going on um, while Jesus was ministering. They were always running around following him trying to figure out who he was. But they, they had uh, records of um, different scholars in that time, scribes, Pharisees mainly, um, and priests who studied what they understood to be the messianic prophecies. And this Deuteronomy 18 was one of them. So it wasn't like the prophet Isaiah or the prophet Jeremiah who prophesied into their contemporary situation and prophesied into the future, um, actually to the return of the Lord. Uh, this Deuteronomy 18 prophet was a special figure who was to be the Messiah 
And so the Messiah had different attributes. Are you following me? Yes, I'm listening. <laughs> okay. So they, this is how they believed. Okay. This is how um, those who studied Messianic prophecy in the time of Jesus, this is what they were looking for. They were looking for number one, that Deuteronomy 18, the prophet. They were looking for the son of David, somebody who would be in the line of David who would become a king. They were looking for a high priest. Now, this was forbidden. A high priest could not be king and a king could not be high priest. Only the Messiah could be king and high priest, meaning he had to be from the line of David and from the line of Aaron. And uh, so those three things characterized what they believed to be the messiah prophet king and high priest and they thank were you. looking for all of those things okay thank you, thank you pamela <laughs> anyone else no i can't see any more hands if uh, for those of you who are blacked out and I can't see you, if you have a question, just unmute and, and ask right now. Well, I think that's it, Pamela. Some good questions. Very good questions. Yeah, giving clarity. Wonderful. So this truly is Bible study. We have taken two hours out to just sit around the word of God and it's been two hours really well spent so we will meet again next month I will send out the link to you reminding you um, that we'll be meeting the date and the link it will be the same time four o'clock because Pamela's two hours ahead so it's six o'clock for her when we meet so it's just it's ten past eight now for her so please go back through these scriptures, um, have your notes and just um, relive it, revisit, and we will meet again, the Lord spare on our life, the Lord willing, we always say the Lord willing in a month's time. Mm -hmm. So should we just uh, close in prayer? Yes. Lord, we wanna thank you so much for this time of being together. Thank you for all these ladies who sacrificed this time to be here as we've gone through your word. We thank you so much for, for Pamela taking us through the scriptures and for the enlightenment we've received and the understanding. Lord, we pray that you'll continue to work upon us by your Holy Spirit. With what we have heard, we will now take away and regurgitate, meditate on, take it down, bring it up again, take it down again, and get a full understanding of what you would have us to see and understand. And we ask that you'll watch between us all until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen. You can unmute and say bye to each other. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye